Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 16 through 23. Colossians 2, 16 through 23. Life is a matter of the heart. Think about it. Life is a matter of the heart. What's driving your heart? What are you and I focused on in our lives? What is our life all about? As Christians, we would say Christ. And then I would ask, really? Is it about your job, your employment, the people you know, what you do? Or is it really about Christ? How Christ-centered am I? in my life we just can't answer that off the cuff this morning it's something that you and I need to really think through carefully about my heart before the Lord what is really important to me in my life that's the question before us this morning and that's what we're going to look at here in Colossians chapter 2 Verses 16 through 23. Shall we pray before we study? <clears throat> Father in heaven, how we praise your holy name. And we thank you for the life that you've given to us in Christ. And for this time to worship you, the true and living God. And so, Father, we come now to worship you through the reading and teaching of your holy word. I pray that you'll continue to keep the evil one from us. Help us to focus on you and... Our hearts and minds would be open before you as you would give us instruction from your scripture by your Holy Spirit. Father, how I pray that your children would be spiritually refreshed and renewed and encouraged. And that those here today who are lost in sin, who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. Father, that you will reveal your love to them through Christ by your Spirit they would come to know Christ, confessing and repenting of their sin and asking for forgiveness. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand for the reading of God's holy word? Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism or worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Amen. You may be seated. As you remember, the folks in Colossa were just overwhelmed with tradition and philosophy. All kinds of religions that will get one to heaven or satisfy you. And Paul comes in and presents the gospel. And he points out Christ. And Christ alone for salvation. And meaning in life in Christ. And you and I are faced with the same thing today. It's not any different. Not any different at all. 
And as believers in Christ, we are distracted with so much in our lives that if we're not careful, slowly and carefully, we can fall into the ways of the world in our thinking and in our living. And so today, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture, and I want us to think, what is really the essence of my life? What, what is it that, that I am so focused on and I have to have in order to keep me going day in and day out? Is it a cup of coffee? Is it a drug? Is it a relationship? Is it my job? What is it? That makes me tick. Let's look at, uh, first of all, a couple of warnings here. And the first one I want to give to you is taken out of the book of Proverbs. So if you'll turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 12. And remember, Proverbs is a book of principles, not promises. And so in Proverbs 14, 12, we're giving this principle. And this is the one that we as believers need to be aware of, and anyone not a believer, think about this. <clears throat> In Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. There is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. There are millions of people in this world today who think that if they're good enough, they're going to heaven. That if they've been baptized, they're going to heaven. That if they're going to church, they're going to heaven. All of that, well, none of that will get you into heaven. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But these folks who believe that genuinely believe that is true. And biblically, it is not. And so we have to realize that there are a lot of people in this world, a lot of people in our neighborhoods who think that way. And they really believe it's the way that they're going to get into heaven, and it's not. Now, let's go back to Colossians chapter 2. And there are two warnings given by Paul in verse 16 and one in verse 18. And let's look at these verses. Look at verse 16. He says here, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food, drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Let no one pass judgment on you. The word, the, the word judgment there is to condemn. It means to make an evaluation to determine good or bad, and based on if it's bad, we condemn. That's the word judgment, and that's what that word means. Don't let people condemn you because you don't eat certain foods and you don't drink a certain way or drink certain drinks and uh, that you don't observe certain days and all this festival, that's, that's all empty. There's no essence. There's no substance to that in life. So don't allow anybody put the guilt on you that you're not following their religious practices. Look at verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up with re without reason by his sensuous mind. Notice it says here, let no one disqualify you. Uh, this disqualify, this word means to deprive you of salvation. Oh, you don't need Christ. You just need to follow these rules. You just need to do this or do that. They're leading you away from Christ. They're leading into darkness and not to light. And we don't listen to that. That's not the way of salvation. And yet these people here are thinking along those lines. Now, let's look at the thinking of a non-believer. Look at chapter 2 and verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit 
according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Be very careful of human traditions and philosophies. They're empty. Political ideology it has nothing to do with the spiritual life. And it leads to death. We also see here in verse 19 where it says, And not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. Uh, they don't have anything to do with God. Not a thing. They don't believe in God. They don't want to hear about God. And so these people, you and I know that there are people like that in this world. We possibly have some in our families. We might work with some folks like that. We might have neighbors like that. They're all over the place. And they're very dogmatic on what they believe. And they try to convince us, you're crazy to believe what you believe. And yet we're not crazy. And so we have to be very careful. Now, let's look at the life of a believer. Let's look at what the scripture says about the essence of life. What our heart is to be about. And that's in verse 19. We're going to take this statement that I've just read to you about non-believers. Not holding on to the head. Because for the believer, we should hold on to the head. So to begin with, life is a matter of the heart. We have to ask ourselves, what is the spiritual, what is the spiritual condition of my heart? And first and foremost, we must know Jesus Christ personally as our Savior. It's always interesting, and I'd, I'd ask you to think about this. I like to ask people where they go to church. Where do you go to church? Oh, I go to such and such a church. And then ask them the next question. Who's the pastor? Oh, I just started there, and I haven't, don't know him that well. Strike two. Not that he's going to get you into heaven, but you will at least know the guy's name that you've been there. He might not know you, but you ought to know who he is. All right? So then you say, okay, let's say they've go, been going to this church years. And, oh, I go to such and such a church. Oh, okay, great. How long have you been there? They tell you. And they say, well, when did you become a believer? See, that separates church membership from personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you see someone with a deer in the headlight look, you know, uh-oh, they don't understand here. And you must make that distinction. And that's an easy, non-threatening way to do it. And then you ask them about, well, what do you believe about Jesus Christ? And then you will know where they are spiritually. Because if they do not say something along the lines, oh, Jesus Christ is my Savior. He died for my sin and was raised from the dead, and I trust in him. I know him. That is a good general testimony of faith in Christ. And if they say, well, I was baptized as an infant. So, what about your faith in Christ? You see, you've got to focus people on Jesus Christ. So that's where we begin. Life is a matter of the heart, and the matter of the heart, the essence of the heart begins with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, what about from that point on? What do we do with, from that point on? Let's go back to uh, verse 19. It says, holding fast to the head. Holding fast. The, the verb holding fast there uh, means to keep carefully. Keep carefully and faithfully. It means to pay attention to the head. I remember when I was in the Air Force and we were marching to receive our uniforms about the second day. And you know how musically inclined I am and and there was no music, but the cadence of the D.I.'s voice. 
and uh, I wasn't doing too well, and I was at the I was uh, at the position because I just ended up there as first squad leader, and the DI calls cadence off the first squad leader, and I was messing up, and he came up to me and put his arm around me and said, "Son, anybody believe that? I got land. I'll sell you." He picked me up off my feet, and he had a few choice words to say of which I only remember, I don't want to see your face again, and threw me on the ground. And he marched the flight off. And I'm sitting on the ground thinking, I don't know where I am. And he don't want to see me anymore. What am I going to do now? So he was marching up here. The flight's here, and I got back over here. And wherever he went that day, I went the opposite direction. Because I had to keep my eye on him because I didn't know where I was going. We have to keep our eye on Christ and Christ alone. He is the essence of our heart. He is the essence of our life. And if we take our eyes off Christ, where are we going to go? Where do we have a tendency to wander? Into the world. Into darkness into deception, into that which is not truth. Brothers and sisters, in the day in which you and I are living, it is imperative that we keep our hearts focused on Christ and Christ alone. Look at chapter 1 of Colossians in verse 18. Paul, talking about Jesus, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Look at that phrase, in everything he might be preeminent. Preeminence, as you know, means to have first place, not second, but first. And notice the phrase, in everything, in my thoughts, in my desires, in what I think, the manner in which I think, the way I say things to people, everything about my life and your life in Christ, He is first and foremost. And no one else and nothing else is to take that place that he has. The question I have to ask myself, is he really first in my life? Because biblically, he's supposed to be. He should be. He is to be. And that's the essence of my life. It's not my job. It's Christ. Who I am is because of who Christ is in me. Not what I accomplish. Not who I know or what I know. It's all in Christ. And that's what it's, life is all about. So we hold fast to the head. He is the first. And we just hold on to him and never let him go. Or never look the other way. It's Christ and Christ alone. Now notice when we hold on to the head. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 19. <clears throat> Holding fast to the head. From whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God, nourished. Let's look at the word nourished. The word nourished there means to give support. It means to give support. So we're nourished as we hold on to Jesus Christ. That verb nourish is in a passive voice, which means it comes into us. We don't earn it. We, we can't get it on our own. God in his grace nourishes us spiritually. He makes us what we are and who we are. 
not ourselves. It's what Christ does in us that is so important. So we're nourished. Now, look at knit together. The word knit together means to knit together in one whole. One whole. And, and this verb form is also very interesting because, first of all, it's present tense, which means he's always knitting us. He's knitting us to him and to the body of Christ, making us one whole. And it's a passive voice, which means he's doing it in and through us and to us. We're not doing it ourselves. But as all of us are focused on Christ and him alone, and he is preeminent in us, and we see him knitting us together in Christ, being one spiritually. Now, please turn with me to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Now let's look at the first three verses. First three verses. Well, let's first four verses. And that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest. And we have seen it and we testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Look at verse 3. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you. And now, so that, those two words gives us the purpose by, for the presentation. So that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father. When we talk about this knitting together, then there comes the fellowship, the koinonia, where we love each other, we know each other, we pray for each other, we encourage each other, we build each other up in Christ. And our fellowship is special, it's spiritual, it's close. And he says, indeed, our fellowship is with him. You and I cannot have that fellowship First of all, until we are in Christ. So all who have faith in Jesus Christ, first of all, has that faith with our Savior and Lord. And if he's truly preeminent in our life, then that relationship that you as a believer in Christ has with him is very special and is very close, very intimate. And as a result of the fellowship that you and I have with the Lord, then that same fellowship should have the same results within the body of Christ. Close and intimate and special. And you can sense the presence of God as we come together and worship and pray and serve the Lord together. It's present everywhere if Christ is preeminent in each of us and as a church as a whole, that should be an obvious result of being knit together by God. That's the essence of the heart. The essence of the heart is on Christ. And then from Christ, it goes to each other. And there comes the fellowship and the love and the praying and the lifting each other up. We're knit together in one whole. This is a neat thing 
uh, about uh, mission work and going on mission trips is to go to countries of a different culture, as Boto has explained to us today, and, and, and going on a couple of trips, and one was with Boto, immediately, immediately, when you meet another believer, boom, when Boto and I first met each other, I said, he's crazy. No, I didn't, did I, Boto? <laughs> immediately, Boto and I hit it off. The first time we met each other, why? Because the preeminence of Christ in our lives. And we serve the Lord together in Russia. Who would have thought an American preacher and a German would be in Russia sharing the gospel? It makes no sense, humanly speaking. But in Christ, it makes perfect, perfectly good sense. And that's fellowship. And God has maintained that between the two of us over the years. That's what it's all about, folks. That's what it's all about. And so we're knit together. Now, let's go back to verse 19 and look at that uh, last phrase. It grows with the growth that is from God. First of all, look at the verb grows. It's a causative verb. So God causes us to grow. And, and that verb is present tense also, which means we're always growing. We're always growing spiritually. To be spiritually alive means there needs to be spiritual nourishment. Any organism that's living has to have some kind of nutrition to sustain it and make it grow. All of us are still growing. And I'm not going to say which way. Let's move on. But we are growing. Are you growing spiritually? What is God doing in your life to cause you to grow spiritually? What's happening to you? What's happened to you this past week? That God, you can see God working in you and God causing you to grow. God making you look at your heart and look at your life and making you reevaluate priorities and, and the way you're thinking and what we're doing to get our attention on Him so we may grow spiritually. That's what God does. It's a spiritual appetite that we have. He causes us to grow with a growth. The word growth there just literally mean, means increase. Are you increasing spiritually in your wisdom and knowledge and spiritual understanding and discernment? I pray for us. I pray that our agape would in Increase more and more with epigonosco. I pray for all of you this way. And I use the word agape when I pray because it's, it's a love from God. That God's love would be poured into us. So we would be saturated with that love. That love of commitment and loyalty. And I don't pray with gnosko. That's knowledge. I pray for epigonosco. Full knowledge of whom? Christ and his wisdom, that all of us would have that for our spiritual growth, our spiritual maturity. Because, brothers and sisters, that's the essence of life, is our spiritual health. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. The sin's got to go. The sin has to go in all of us. The Holy Spirit convicts and reveals and, and we see the sinfulness in our faces it's got to go. And then look what we're supposed to do. Like newborn babes, long for the pure spiritual milk 
that by it you may grow up into salvation. The pure spiritual milk. Too many Christians want snack food from, from, they want homilies and not sermons. They want sermons that are always uplifting and good and make you feel good. You're in the wrong church if you want that from me. I'm going to teach the Word of God to you. And sometimes you might feel like I'm after you. It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit. When the hound of heaven gets after you, you better listen. Because he's been after me big time big time and I'm learning to listen in a new way we need to pay attention to what the spirit of God is saying into our hearts it's very important for when we listen and we desire that pure spiritual word we grow we grow spiritually am I growing are you growing? And if you're not, there's a serious spiritual problem called sin. And it prohibits spiritual growth. Notice here in 19. Grows with the growth that is from God. That is from God. He knows. Our Heavenly Father knows what is best for us and what we need in our lives for spiritual growth. I was uh, raised right up here across from what is now McDonald's and uh, the medical buildings right across the street from McDonald's. We lived in a two story house. And the yard was all dirt. There was no grass in it because there were so many kids out there. We killed the grass. And we didn't have a lot of toys. But you see that hand right there? That was the best bulldozer that I ever had. And I used to, I remember raking across there. And you get a pretty good road that wide for cars. And you'd raise across there. Well, one day I had a big old pile of dirt. And I'm standing, uh, sitting there like that. And I thought, hmm, Bam! I hit that dirt like that. Guess what happened to that dirt? Both eyes. That hurt. I didn't like that. Couldn't see. So I started screaming, running through the house. My mother and my aunt were chasing me. They finally caught me. And they were so mean to me. One of them was on top of me. And the other one was pouring water in my eyes. And I was yelling, stop it. You're killing me. And I remember one of them, I don't know which one, said, this is for your good. Yeah, right. And that's what you and I do to God. We got a, eyes full of dirt, full of sin. And he knows it's not good for us. And he brings conviction. And we're yelling, don't do this to me to God. Don't do this to me. He says, it is for your good. You're going to be better spiritually when I finish this on you. But I was running away from those who could help me. Are you running from God? Is God working in your heart and convicting you in such ways from his word by his spirit? And you're ignoring it. You're rejecting it. You don't want to hear it. Are you running from him? What is God saying to you? And are you and I listening? That's how growth comes. That's how spiritual growth comes. The sin is revealed, is exposed. The Holy Spirit does that from the Word. And that's why the Word of God is so important in our lives. How are you and I responding to the Spirit of God working in us from His Word? What are you and I doing with that? That's what it's all about. But when we respond positively and the Spirit of God brings us to a point of confession and repentance and forgiveness, we grow spiritually. 
and we're stronger. And then God uses us in the lives of other people. But we have to keep growing. It's very important. Now look at verses 20 through 23. He talks about... If you've died with Christ to the elemental spirits of the world, why is if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to these regulations? Why in the world do you and I follow the things of the world? Why do we let people lower us to their standards of thinking when we have the true and living word and we should be thinking godly thoughts and doing godly things and have godly ways about us? Why do we take on the ways of the world? It's not good. And all these empty practices and things. And then look at the very last phrase, starting with the word but. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. All the philosophies and the political ideologies, all of our ways that we think are right, will not cause us to fight the flesh. It nurtures it. So what do I do? Turn to John chapter 15. As a believer in Christ, what do I do? John chapter 15. Verses 1 through 5. Jesus is teaching his disciples in the upper room before they go out to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus will be arrested and this is what Jesus is saying to these men. This is what he's saying to you and me today. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Why? That you may grow more. That, you may, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Jesus Christ, you and I can do absolutely nothing that will honor God and be pleasing to Him that He will use in our spiritual growth. Nothing. Now go to Galatians. So we know that with Christ, without Christ, we can do nothing. Now turn to Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. How does this work out for me tomorrow morning? Or how does this work out for me this afternoon and for the rest of my life? How may the essence of my life, which is Christ, how am I going to do this on a daily basis? Galatians 5, 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Let's stop there. I say, walk by the Spirit. The verb walk there means to conduct your life by the Spirit of God. So now I've got to stop and say, do I do that? Do I do that throughout the day? In every circumstance, in every situation I'm in, am I being conducted by the flesh or my own thinking, my own way, what I think is best? Or am I going by the Holy Spirit? What the Spirit of God is leading me to be and to do and to conduct myself. Who's in control here? Me or the Holy Spirit? So it says walk by the Spirit. The little preposition in there, by, refers to the means by which we're walking. And what does it say? You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The word gratify there means to satisfy or to fulfill. 
We've already been told by Paul in Colossians that all these rituals and empty practices and everything will have nothing to do with the indulgences of the flesh. Well, how do I overcome them? By walking by the Spirit. Then in verse 17 of Gal uh, Galatians 5, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Every believer, a genuine believer, should have a desire in his or her life to walk with the Lord, to honor Him in every aspect of the life. But this flesh over here is going to stop you and stop me. It's called a spiritual warfare. Paul addresses spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. It's real. So we've got to realize I'm in a war here. And there's evil present, and there's evil trying to cause me to change the essence of my heart to the world instead of to Christ. And I've, you and I, because in 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You and I have the power to put the skids on that. And that power is in Christ, in the Spirit of God dwelling in us. So our, our hearts are not changed away from God, but to God. And it's a battle, folks, and it's not easy. Life. It's a matter of the heart. So I've got to keep focused on my heart. Am I doing that? What is my focus in life? It should be Christ. And how he directs us. How is he directing you? Moto was in the Ukraine and in Russia. He closed the door and put him in Pakistan. Is God closing a door for you and for me? And is he opening another door someplace else? I don't know. I don't have a clue. But am I open to the direction of God because my life is on Christ and I'm obedient to him? And what he wants me to be and what he wants me to do. That's where you and I are right this very moment. So I would just ask you, think about this. Think about this. Life. It's a matter of the heart. And I would encourage every one of you here today, this afternoon... You take these passages of Scripture. Don't focus on me and what I said. You focus on the Scriptures and see what the Holy Spirit reveals to you. See if my heart is where my heart is supposed to be before the Lord. See if Christ really is preeminent in my life. Because that's what it's all about. And if you're here today and Jesus Christ is not your Savior... Christ is not even in your life, let alone preeminent in it. You need to come to know Christ as Savior. You need to come and, and acknowledge your sin and repent and confess and ask for forgiveness. Then you begin the process of Christ being preeminent in your life. So the Holy Spirit has spoken to every one of us in this room. I don't doubt it at all. So let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to your heart and respond to him. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you for the instruction you've given to us from your word by your Holy Spirit. Whatever I've said that's not pleasing to you, blot it out of our hearts and minds. May your message and yours alone be applied to our hearts by your Spirit. 
And I pray that each of us would give serious consideration to the essence of our heart and then really evaluate, is Christ preeminent in it? Father, as we sing this closing hymn, move in our hearts by your Spirit. For this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.